Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So after our last video where I talk about the anxieties of dealing with an autism diagnosis, I thought it was really important to follow up with a video about how to manage your life after a diagnosis because a lot changes in this time. And I'm guessing if you're here, you have spent months and years trying to get a diagnosis. You have spent all your energy, your time, your resources on trying to get the EHCP plan, trying to get the diagnosis, trying to get the therapies. However, it's very difficult to try and find the balance and you kind of lose yourself along the way. Life is difficult, right? We, we have so many different things going on. And then when you have a child uh, on the spectrum, it can, it can make you feel quite isolated. And I'm gonna speak from my journey um, now because it's something that I haven't really spoken about a, a great deal. And it's something that I think a lot of you might resonate with. When I got Dylan's diagnosis, I, I don't know, I don't know, what, was it tiredness? Because Dylan wasn't sleeping and I was so sort of wrapped up in everything to do with him. I kind of withdrew from society and I, maybe this is a form of depression. I don't know uh, really the answer to that, but I withdrew from a lot of people and I lost a lot of friendships because you know it's no fault of anyone's but you know they would invite me out or they would invite me to go to the playground with their children and i couldn't do this you know i tried a few times and every time i'd go dylan would run off in the other direction i felt like i couldn't speak to the parents because i was constantly up and down i don't know was i i, I don't know was i embarrassed i don't know was i i was just stressed out I felt like I had nothing to talk about. I felt like I had nothing to bring to the table. I felt like my whole world was around Dylan and the diagnosis and the therapies. And, you know, um, we did get invited to a few birthday parties and Dylan would go and he would scream or he would bite a child or he would hit a child. And, and then I would burst into tears because I was constantly on the edge of, of those emotions were constantly there. I felt like, I felt like I had a, I don't know, I felt like someone was strangling me half the time. I felt like my emotions were just here that I could cry at any moment. And I'm probably still like that. When we would go to parties, I found it difficult seeing other children, um, other children speaking, other children getting along, other children playing with other children. And I would look at Dylan and he wasn't doing that. And I was just like, well, I don't, I kind of don't want to see that right now. I think I put my head in the sand a bit and I really did withdraw from people and when people would ask me to meet for coffee or go for a walk I would get to the day and I'd be so tired Dylan wouldn't have slept and I would just make excuses and I would just say oh really sorry I can't come you know and I think I was almost too embarrassed to say Dylan's had a really bad night or I'm just not coping because I'm not that kind of person I've been brought up where come on you can get up you can do it and I find it really hard to say, hey, I'm struggling. And I think a lot of people do, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to admit that you are struggling. And I just really withdrew from everybody, really, um, apart from my family and a very few friends who would literally just come to my door and be like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I know what you're doing, you know, and I've got, you know, two of my best friends would every time you know i wouldn't pick up my phone i'd get a message or a voice message going i know you're not feeling great but i'm still here and you know those friendships are you know, the most important and dear to me um but a lot of people didn't understand and that's not their fault i didn't let them in yeah and i would be scared to tell people the truth you know like i said i would have a happy face on and be like everything's fine and you know i'd get the few odd comments being like oh it must be really hard to parent and and i think they're they're well-meaning um you know, oh, it looks quite hard, was was like, no, no, it's not hard. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But the sleep deprivation is probably one of the worst because, you know, when you have slept and you're feeling strong and you're like, I can do this, um, that's great. But a lot of us parents don't sleep and our children are jumping in the middle of the night. And, you know, even if they are sleeping, we're thinking, 
they've been to the toilet today, they haven't eaten very much, am I giving the right supplements, what am I going to do about this therapy or that therapy, and your head just goes on this loop, on this negative loop, this train that keeps going around and around, and I found it very hard and very overwhelming. But it's possibly one of the worst things you can do is to retreat from people. But what do you do? How do you, you can't go to someone else's house because Dylan quite often would get to the door and be like, ah, I'm not going in. Or, you know, would not say anything, but would run off in a different direction or he would scream or I was worried about him poo smearing and I'd be like, oh my God, I can't do this. And then I was worried about him around other children. Is he gonna lash out? Well, and then I'd see their faces if they looked at Dylan lashing out. I'd be like, oh, I just wanted to take him home and, and make him feel safe. But then also home didn't really feel safe to me because when I would go to the therapies, I would do the speech therapy or the play therapy and I did all these therapies. When I was there and I was observing and I was writing notes and I felt empowered because I was doing something. I felt empowered that, you know, Dylan was getting the help that he needed. But then I would come home and as soon as I closed the door, I would get this overwhelming like crying and upset and just like, I can't do this and am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? I don't. I don't know. And it's funny because that's where the idea of my book came from, coming home to autism, because home is meant to be your safe haven. And it kind of occurred to me one night, I was like, if the outside world is scary to Dylan and to me, the outside world was scary to me. I was like, I can't go to a coffee shop. I can't go out for dinner. I couldn't really find a babysitter to look after Dylan because no one could look after him. So all these things just made me withdraw from society. And I was thinking, well, home is meant to be my safe haven and my safe place, but it wasn't. And that's where the idea of the book came from, coming home to autism, meaning how do you make your home safe for your child and for you? So a few of the things that I started doing was really making my home as child friendly as possible. We have trampolines and slides and, you know, sensory toys. And I was started inviting people over to my house. I thought, well, look, I can't withdraw from society forever because it wasn't helping me. And so I had a lot of coffee dates and play dates at my house, which was amazing. And you slowly start to trust these other people. It might mean meeting up with another parent who has another child on the spectrum. And it wasn't really play dates for Dylan, it was more like play dates for me, um, where you know we'd have coffee and we'd start talking about things. And I would say, you know, it's quite difficult to take Dylan out, but could you come to my house? And that really helped me um, sort of open up a bit more. I felt comfortable because I knew Dylan would be happy at home. I put him in his little sensory tent with his iPad and even if he didn't play with anyone, it was fine. It was more for me. I think that was the first step for being like, okay, I have to try and help myself here because you know Dylan needs me and I need to be in a good mental health space. But it's very difficult to think about yourself in these moments, especially when you're tired and you have so many emotions and feelings going on. So I started a journal as well, a gratitude journal actually, just writing down the things I was grateful for and happy for and my little wins of the day. Maybe my little win of the day was, hey, you had a smoothie or maybe Dylan did something um, you know, like didn't cry that day or, you know, just writing down the little things that I was grateful for really started to help me. Um, I also, again, I've spoken about this before, would put on my music in the morning if my mood I felt was going down, I'd put my music on. And I also started saying to my friends, you know, don't let me back out. You know, if, if I back out, it's because I'm really anxious. And I just started becoming, I kind of wore my heart on my sleeve a bit and was like, look, this is me, this is my life. It's a bit hectic. Um, but please don't give up on me. And I think it's really important to be honest with yourself and with a close circle of friends because people will understand. And I think your friends don't know what to do. They don't know what to do or say, or they wanna make, they wanna help you. You know, we've, we've surround ourselves with, with lovely people. If they're not lovely people, get rid of them, get some new ones in, <laughs> you know? Um, and accept that friendships will change but the ones that are your, your core friends, just be honest with them and say, I'm struggling. This is how you can help me. Don't give up on me. If I cancel, please hold me accountable because I don't want to cancel. And quite often it was the fear of actually getting Dylan in the car or going to a place. And actually what started to happen miraculously, sometimes Dylan would surprise me. We would go and actually he had a great time. He didn't have a meltdown and that really helped. And I was like, oh, actually, once I'm there, I'm fine. It was just the fear of leaving the house, the fear of the what ifs, the fear of the rejection, the, the looks, 
everything. But the more I kind of pushed myself out of my comfort zone and told my friends to hold me accountable and be like, don't give up on me, the easier it became. So I think if you're feeling like this, write your gratitude journal of little things that you're happy for. Try and get some movement in every day. I know you're tired and I need to watch this video back myself and do it, but try and get some movement in, whether it's dancing around the kitchen, jumping on your child's mini trampoline. I do that quite often with Dylan now, but just moving, getting yourself out to nature, breathing, making your home. I really find if I hone in on getting my home cozy, lovely. I, I love interiors, obviously. Um, and I mean, I kind of hide behind the fact that Dylan likes these colors. I don't think Dylan actually knows this is the colors or not. I think it's me. I think because I'm quite sensory, I need a, a calm home. I need, I like organizing. Organizing helps me organize my brain and my head. The other thing I would do is put off things. I would put off going to the dentist. I'd put off going to the doctors. I would put off things for myself. A bit like a, a martyr. Is that the right word? I, I think I would, yeah, I was quite, I was quite mean to myself actually. I wouldn't feed myself properly. I would just live off sugar and tea because I was tired. And I'm thinking, well, that's not very good. And I knew the things to do for myself, but I just wouldn't do them. I became last and you cannot become last. You have to put yourself first and it is very difficult. And that is by filling up your own cup. And that could be going to the movies alone, grab myself some popcorn, get a babysitter who can look after Dylan or get your partner or family to look after your child so you can just have a bit of brain free time. Does that make sense? <laughs> brain free time. I'm in a different situation, you know, watching a movie where I'm getting lost in the movie and I'm not thinking about autism or the kids or what they've eaten or whatever. But that is really important for your brain just to switch it off. Brain free time. Being gentle with yourself, knowing that there are other people out there who also feel this way, I think also helps, which is why I wanted to do this video because you know, obviously I'm doing this mentoring and the more parents I speak to, the more I'm like, wow, we've been on the same kind of journey and no one really wants to talk about this. It's like no one really spoke about postnatal depression for ages and now it's a thing you can talk about. So it is important to bring these um, subjects up. So yeah, managing your own uh, feelings and understanding and reaching out to friends is really important. How do you balance other children? How do you manage other children in your house with a child you know on the spectrum this is important to carve out special time for them whether it be a little chat at night time making them feel they're part of your team so with luca and naya i constantly have conversations with them especially now that they're older and being like you know we're a team and we're going to help them do this and i'm going to help you help your feelings and you know doing structured play with them, um, whether it be, you know, the boys against mommy and daddy or, you know, Naya and Luca against me and Dylan. Like I try and make us teams and, and, and try and strengthen those bonds. And I also try and do one-on-one -on -one time, whether I take Luca out for a little walk by myself or it could just be even tickle time or, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult to get out with just one child, but it's really important to keep the communication open. And I think with Luca now as well, he's 10, almost 10. I say to him, you know, sometimes mommy finds it hard too, and I'm sorry if I'm a bit snappy or grumpy, I'm just tired. And I think by not hiding your feelings from your children is a really good life lesson for them as well. Um, you know, we can't be happy all the time. And I think, especially younger children, if you have a child who's older, um, well, actually, you know, take that back, any child, if you are not in a great place and you're struggling, children pick up on that and they can quite often think it's their fault. So I think it is really important to say, you know, I do find this hard, but it's okay. And how lucky are we that we have X, Y, and Z. So it's important to t express your feelings, but also on the flip side, be like, but we are so lucky and we have our health and all these kind of things. So I do tend to balance it out because I don't want Luca or Naya ever to feel hard done by because this is their life and I can't change that. And I know that Luca gets frustrated, but by validating his feelings and being like, but we get to do this, which maybe some other families don't get to do. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of balancing it out. So how do you cope with going back to work and also having a child? I think it's really important that once you drop your child off at childcare, nursery, school, switch gears and this could be reading a book it could be putting on some music maybe you have your fight song i call it <laughs> you know your your song that gets you revved up it's like right i can do this i have my playlist where i'm like 
you know, if I dropped in at school and he's had a bad morning, I have to switch gears. I have to be like, right, he is safe. He might not be that happy, but he's safe. He's being looked after. I will deal with everything afterwards. But right now I have to work because we have to work. We have to earn money. This is part of life. It's important to, um, I'm not gonna say the word because I can't say it, compartmentalize, can I say it? It's important to do that, to be like, right, they're happy, now switch gears, get into work mode, because like I said, we need to go to work. You know, um, I enjoy going to work. It's another part of me that is actually important. Once work is finished, you can then go back into mummy mode and deal with whatever you have to deal with. But in that moment in time, you need to be present in what you're doing. And this goes for going on dates with your partner. This means meeting up with friends. You know, you can turn your phone off silent if your child is, if you know your child is safe for a minute. Nothing bad is gonna happen if you don't pick up that phone straight away. So it is important just for an hour to give your attention and your time to that person that you're with, give your time and attention to work, you know, and, and, and just be easy on yourself about that. You can't be everything to everyone. And there are certain things in life that we have to do and we can't get around get around it. So I'm probably rambling, but I hope this video has helped a little bit um, just on recognizing your feelings, trying to manage expectations of other people, takes the pressure off yourself, um, being honest with other people, with your close circle, that you are struggling a bit with anxieties and things like that. Uh, make your home a safe haven, invite people into your home, don't be afraid to do that because your child's gonna be more regulated at home. So this is the best place really for you to fill your cup up and for your your children to have other play dates. And if you're lucky enough to get outside to the park, sit out in the sun, go to nature, uh, try and do some breathing techniques for yourself. And um, yeah, just keep communicating with those around you and, and try not to do what I do, which was shut down and the shut off and pretend everything was fine and put on the brave face and really inside it was, I was crying and upset because the more you talk, the more you help yourself and the more your friends and family know how to help you. Um, so I hope that's helped a little bit and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.